John. Welcome to week nine. We were off last week. Dean and I were in California in Napa Valley, which might as well be the Garden of Eden. But we're back and we're on our third week of blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And we, if you recall from our previous two lessons on this, I started off with just the idea that possibly spend a half a lesson on pure in heart because I didn't, I don't have a pure heart. And I didn't really know what to teach about it or on it. And then the Holy Spirit started downloading, downloading, downloading. And I realized we, we'd have to take a full lesson. And then as we got, as I got into it, the Holy Spirit kept showing me more and more things. I realized it'd be two lessons. And then I realized it'd be three. And quite frankly, we could spend a, a, even another week on this, but we'll continue to move on through the Beatitudes as we are studying the Sermon on the Mount this fall and next spring, it looks like it'll take us at least a year to go through the Sermon on the Mount. There is so much in this teaching of Jesus. It's his opening salvo. It's his constitution of the kingdom of God. And please let me remind you that this is all about living in the kingdom of God now. Now. That was Jesus's entire focus was now. Don't wait till you die to go to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, go now. As Dallas Willard said, this is all about living in the kingdom. And these Beatitudes, they are not prescriptive, they're descriptive. They're not prescribing what you have to do or how to act to be in the kingdom. They're, they're describing what it looks like to be in the kingdom. And as you live and, and breathe and move and have your being in the kingdom, the more pure your heart is, the more you purge from your heart impurities, and we'll talk today about sloppy impurities and sinful impurities, sloppy and sinful. The more you purge your heart of those things and then fill your heart up. And remember, your heart is your body, mind, and spirit. It's not your heart where just your emotions are. It's your body, mind, and spirit. In the Hebrew worldview and the biblical worldview, the, the heart is everything. It's your body, mind, and spirit. So the more you purify your body, mind, and spirit, and then fill it back in with things of the Holy Spirit, things of Jesus, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, those fruit of the spirit out of Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the more you shall see God. And what a promise that is. What a promise that is. So we're going to spend more time on this today, and I want to tell you right up front that, that this is more life application than it is teaching. And I try to balance teaching and life application because I want to present the word. I want you to see, and, and, and together let's dig into the, the complexities and the richness of the word, God's word to us, Jesus's word to us. But there's also the life application, and this is more weighted on the life application part, but I will say that, that I'm, I'm undaunted on this life application because what we'll talk about today as we move through the lesson, capturing every thought and making it obedient to Christ and for protecting our heart and then setting up these guardrails has been absolutely life-changing for me, absolutely life-changing. As a matter of fact, when we get to the guardrails part, towards the end of the lesson, I want you to know in advance, this has revolutionized my life. It has changed my life when it comes to ridding my heart of sloppy and sinful conditions. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I have been emphasizing, look at that promise. They shall see God. My goodness, can you imagine what that must mean? Well, Eugene Peterson in the message put it this way. You're blessed when you get your inside world. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. Blessed are you when you get your inside world, your heart and your mind put right. Then you will see more of God in your outside world. You'll start to see him in all the details of your life, which will revolutionize your life. It'll radically change and you'll become a transformed person because you're, you're more and more seeing with the eyes of your heart as well as the eyes of your head, your heavenly father and your Lord and savior and best friend Jesus as you walk through life in the kingdom of God. What a promise. The Holy Spirit stung me over the weekend. 
And he does this, and I'm glad he does this. He says, Sam, you know, you're emphasizing the promise, but what about just a heart that wants to please their heavenly father? Not about any promises, just please him because of who he is, how worthy he is, and what he has done for you. And I thought about that. In my progression as a born-again Christian, early on, very immature, and probably, well, obviously, most of my life, and I'm sure yours before you really got to know Jesus, was I don't want to be punished. So I'll try to behave and I'll try to obey to avoid being punished. Well, then I started to move on to, no, no, I, I see all these promises, these rewards. So I want to obey so he'll reward me. I'll get these promises. But the limitation on that was that I wanted to obey to get the, the rewards that I thought were the rewards I wanted. The desires of my heart, I thought. And as I moved on, I realized, you know, obeying him, following his teaching, that's a better way to think of it. Truly following his teachings would, would change my life. And I would start to live that A plus life to the full the, 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 that Jesus said he'd come to give us, the, the life that is truly life. That became more of my perspective. The prism through which I viewed life was following his teachings helps me live in the kingdom of God in that fullest of life. But as time went on and I became closer and closer to my heavenly father, not God, but my heavenly father and Jesus, not just Jesus, the son of God, but Jesus, my, my savior and, and, and my best friend. It became more about pleasing him, pleasing him, honoring him. So even though I have emphasized the promise, which is incredible, the more pure our hearts become, and it is a process, we know that, but the more pure our hearts become, the more we will see our Heavenly Father in all aspects of our life. That is an incredible promise. The real life that is truly life is to live seeking to please him. Now, I was listening to a teacher out of Nashville, Paige Brown. She's great. And she, man, she is, she's got a Southern accent. I'm sure I do too. I've been told that, but hers is really something. Uh, she, I don't even remember the church. She's in, but some friends gave me a CD of a series she did on the history of the Old Testament. It was fantastic. And at one point she stopped and she said, you know, I want you to think about this. All this we're doing here, the, the Bible, the biblical story, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, all of this that we're talking about, it's either of ultimate importance or it's not important at all but one thing it is never and that is kind of important it's either of ultimate importance or it's not important at all but one thing it never is is kind of important and i want that to sting you because what we're talking about here is going deeper going deeper growing in your relationship. And I'm just going to say it bluntly. If you want to remain your lazy, undisciplined, average, not going deeper, not growing, limited sight seeing self, then stay that way. If you want to remain your lazy, undisciplined, average, not growing, not going deeper, limited sight self, then stay that way. But if you want to go deeper, then you'll take some of the things we're going to talk about today and you'll take them to heart. Because what we're going to talk about today will start the process of purifying your heart more and more, which means you will see your Heavenly Father more and more, which means you, your life will be transformed. Don't be lazy. Don't let Satan and this world distract you from what is of truly ultimate importance. You see, my job, especially with this men's ministry, but my job is to, part of my job is to be sure that I make sure you understand what, how important this is, because you will regret it if you don't. You'll regret not going deeper. It'll either be at some point later in life, or it'll be when you stand before Jesus, and you have to say to him, you know, it just wasn't that important to me. I'm glad I got saved, or I hope I'm saved, but it just what. The whole going deeper thing, that just wasn't important to me. Because you'll have to say that. So I want to 
I want to be sure you understand and don't live with those kind of regrets. And then the other side of it is towards the end of your life, you'll realize how much you left on the table. What an average life you led, what you missed, because it'll come into sharp focus at some point in your life. So I'm, I'm here to say this is of ultimate importance. It's not kind of important. It's ultimate. It's of ultimate importance. But the problem, see, the promise is incredible. The problem is our hearts. Now, I don't know about your heart. Some of your hearts, I'm sure, are way more pure than my heart. And my heart is way more pure than it was before I was born again. And even after I was born again, it's been such a process. But the problem is our heart. And I want to, I want to share screen uh, this first passage from Jeremiah, which is very familiar for many of you. Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who? And beyond cure, who can understand? That's so familiar to most of us. The heart is deceitful above all things. And beyond cure, who can understand it? Can I get an amen on that? What is going on with my heart? As Paul talked about in Romans 7, why do I do the things I don't want to do? And why won't I do the things I want to do? It's because I got a wretched heart. And I need the Holy Spirit to help me purify my heart. That's the big problem we have. And if you think your heart is okay as is, I would encourage you to do some soul searching. But what's interesting is what comes next, verse 10. Because I want to compare this to Psalm 39, 139 that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Whoa. Yikes. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. Look at what David wrote in Psalm 139. And as when we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, I said, what kind of idiot would ask this of God? What kind of, who would, would ask God to search me, God, and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts, see if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting? Who, who's going to ask that? The kind of person that wants their heart cleaned out, the kind of person that wants to go deeper, the kind of person that doesn't want anything getting in the way. That's who would ask that. Because they know their heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. It's interesting in this Jeremiah passage, what, the, what leads, what precedes the heart is deceitful above all things is really the answer to the person who will search, who says, search me and know my heart. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It le its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. See, that's, that's the kind of person that's going to ask their Heavenly Father to search their hearts. Because their heart is deceitful. And they know it, and you know it. So we're going to move now to guarding our hearts, because now we know that's the issue. And this famous passage that we all have heard before, and I'm going to share screen with you on this, because Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, because it is, for it is the wellspring of life. The wellspring of life. What is the wellspring? What is a wellspring? Isn't it the source? The source that bubbles up and then becomes a stream and becomes a river. It always has a source at some point, typically in the mountains somewhere or whatever. The wellspring of life, your heart, your body, mind, and spirit is the wellspring of life, and you better guard it. Because I'm telling you, my friend, the barbarians are at the gate. Your thoughts are the world's thoughts, your thoughts, Satan's thoughts. They're, they're pounding into your head. And they're getting into your heart. And when they get into your head and your heart, then they become actions. Whether they are actions that you act out or actions that sit, sit and stir and putrefy in your heart. Not purify, but putrefy in your heart. If you don't guard that heart. I think about the wellspring of life. You know, above Greenville, I live in Greenville, South Carolina. And above Greenville, we have the Table Rock Wet Reservoir. It's a big lake. My grandfather, same name as mine, who was a master engineer, had a design part in, in a, and a project manager role in the dam around that lake and piping that water into Greenville. But you cannot put a boat on the Table Rock Reservoir Lake. 
You cannot go fishing in that lake. You cannot ski. You cannot do anything in that lake. And why? Because we don't want to get anything into that lake, any impurities into that lake. Years ago, back in my subdivision development days, I was developing with a couple of guy partners out of Hilton Head Island, a big project called Half Mile Lake. And right up the road on that side of Greenville was a golf course community called Pebble Creek. And I became friends with the manager of the, of the whole golf course community. And, and uh, one day he took me up on a, in a helicopter so he could look at his sprinkler patterns. And as we were up there, I was looking at his lagoons and I said, these lagoons are beautiful. They got this incredible greenish blue water. I had developed a couple of lagoons in our development and mine looked like brackish water. And I said, how do you keep it? How, where is, how does this happen? He said, I dye them. I put dye in the, in the lagoon. He said, you want me to put some in yours? I said, yes, I do. That'd be great. So he put this dye in, my, in, my, in, my, in the two lagoons that we had and they looked beautiful. But what happened? It eventually flowed right on out because it was just dye in the pond versus changing the source. To keep that color, I would have had to change the source. That's what most of us do. We try to dye our lagoons so that we look pretty on the outside, but we don't change the source. Our heart has to be changed. And so we've got to guard our heart once we purge the things that we know are in there, and that is a process that goes on the rest of our lives, and we pour back into our hearts the things that are of Jesus, now we have to protect it. Above all else, guard your hearts because it is, they are the wellspring of life. We have to be serious about guarding our heart or we will not continue to grow and go deeper. Second Corinthians 7.1 let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. That's what we're talking about here. I shared this story with you last week. When I was on the Clemson basketball team, we had a, 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 a player on it named Alan Hoover. And Alan was one of these guys that way back then, he was already into body, mind, and spirit. And he was a health nut. And we're going through the training table and he's right next to me and I'm getting a, a drink and I'm getting a Coke. And he just looked at me and he looked down at the Coke and he looked at me and said, dirt in the carburetor. Dirt in the carburetor. He didn't say another word. I knew what he meant. He's putting water into his system. I'm putting a soda, Coca-Cola into my system. So I want that to be a byword for you, dirt in the carburetor. Dirt in the carburetor. Dirt in the carburetor. Is it sloppy? Is it sinful? It's dirt in the carburetor. And I don't want it in there. I want to get it out and then I want to keep it from coming in. I don't want that. That's what Alan was saying. I, I wouldn't put that in my body. So as we go through this lesson, think about in terms of sloppy or sinful. Is it dirt in the carburetor? So the first step, we have to take captive every thought. We have to take captive every thought, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and make it obedient to Christ. Because as I said, the barbarians are at the gate. They're, the thoughts are coming into your head and you have to take them captive before they take root, before they make a nest in your head because they're coming. So the first line of defense is to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Because those thoughts are coming. You cannot stop the thoughts. Now, the more you purify your heart, the less those thoughts even become a problem. But for the time being, they're a problem. And we have to grab them, physically wrestle them down. If it takes that kind of animation in your heart and your mind and that visualization to grab it and physically take those thoughts and throw them out, kick them in the tail, get them out of your head. Don't let them rest, nest in there. Don't let them take root in there. Get them out. Now, what kind of thoughts do we need to take captive? You know, you know what thoughts are ping-ponging around in your head. See, I have, at all times, I have two to three conversations going on in my head all the time. Even as I'm talking to you right now, I got a couple of conversations going on in my head right now. And sometimes I lose track because of that, and I go, oh, what was I talking about? The kind of thoughts that come into our head, let's start with things, thoughts such as resentment. 
I remember something somebody said or did, or I'm keeping it, I'm holding on to it. And that, that, that takes, makes a nest in my head and then gets into my heart and then becomes part of my actions. Resentment, judging. You probably don't deal with that, but I have a judgmental heart. There are a whole bunch of idiots around me, especially on the highway. Fear, anxiety, greed, lust. We got to grab these thoughts and throw them down. Not let them take root. Make them obedient to Christ. Take captive every thought. If you want to go deeper, if you want to purify your hearts, this is an exercise. It won't be easy, but you cannot be lazy. You have to be proactive about this. I want to be proactive about it. For husbands, now, I don't know about you ladies' minds, although you're not that different. We're all human and we're all living in this human condition. But for husbands, I know that, that a thought that can lodge into my head is, here we go again. Here we go again. Either, either uh, Dina is saying something or some other friend or some family member or one of the men I deal with. But if that thought gets, especially when it comes to your wife, man, here we go again, you're in trouble. As a matter of fact, I'm just being transparent here. At one point out in the trip in California, Dina said something and, and that thought popped into my head. Here we go again. And I rolled my eye. Now I was, I was rolling out of bed. We, it wasn't really rolling out of bed. We'd been doing our quiet time reading the scripture as we sat in the bed, but I was rolling out and I rolled my eyes as I rolled out thinking she wouldn't see me as I rolled out and she saw me. Because that thought popped into my head. Here we go again. Another thought for you men, now I don't deal with this anymore, but another thought for a whole bunch of men is, well, wow, she's cute. Or she thinks I'm funny. Or she thinks I'm smart. Or she thinks I'm powerful and successful. Oh, she's cute. And then that next thought is, you know, nothing wrong with going to lunch. Nothing wrong with having that, just a little more of a conversation. Nothing wrong with a text. You got to grab those kind of thoughts, my friend. And if you're a, a wife, and you have that thought about some other man. My husband doesn't think I'm cute, sweet, funny, interesting, whatever, but he does. You got to grab those thoughts. Take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That is the first line of defense. That's not easy. I mean, the barbarians are at the gate. Sloppy and sinful. Dirt in the carburetor. It's not easy. You're going to need help with this. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. I always want to be sure you understand none of this is going to be a self-help program you have your role to play philippians 2 12 continue to work out your salvation not work for but work out your salvation that's your role for it is god who works in you to will and act according to your good his good purpose that's his role you're going to need help with this you're going to need holy spirit power learn to lean into the holy spirit to lean on the holy spirit to ask him if he's real and he is and if Jesus' promises about the Holy Spirit are real, and they are, he's there to help you. He's there to assist you in this. And what we have found over all these years of walking with Jesus is, is really, see, Dallas Willard said, God is not opposed to effort. He's opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort is what Dallas Willard said. It's opposed to earning. We do these things not to earn anything from our Heavenly Father, but we do make the effort. And what we've learned is if, if you can think about a football field, if you're on the zero yard line, your own goal line, you just start taking some steps. You get to the one yard line, the two yard line, the three yard line. And what you will find is your heavenly father, Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, they'll come all the way across the field. They'll come the 97 yards to, to meet you where you are and assist you in going further. They will just make some effort. That's very biblical. Peter says it. Paul says it. James says it, make every effort. But you're going to need some help with this. And the final part of this conversation today is about guardrails. Guardrails and accountability. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, when Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And if your right eye causes you to sin, cut, gouge it out. He's talking about taking measures to prevent your natural self from holding you back, from keeping you from going deeper, and certainly keeping you from going into the kingdom of God because you, you will not stop your sinful life. 
But as you live in the kingdom, you're going to have sloppy things in your life. You're going to have sinful things in your life. You're going to need some help with this. And we talk about accountability and we talk about guardrails. Accountability, Irv Philpott and I, and I have this with a couple other men, not on as consistent a basis, but Irv and I get together every Wednesday and we talk about our lives together. And we talk about the good things in our lives and, and we talk about the failures in our lives and we talk about the things that are worrying us and we talk about the hopes that we have we you know we talk about body mind and spirit are you getting enough sleep are you eating how's your eating is your exercising we talk about these things we talk about what are you letting into your mind did you watch you know and i will confess look i watched this movie the other night and i knew what was going to be in it and i continued to watch it now i got all that in my head i got dirt in the carburetor in my head some of it sinful some of it just flat out sloppy but to have someone that you do life with that you can say, look, I'm struggling with this and I want you to hold me accountable. I need for you to hold me accountable. Oftentimes it's, it's okay, so let's drop back. First Corinthians six, Paul is writing to the people in Corinth. Corinth is like Las Vegas. Las Vegas has a saying, doesn't it? Whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, Corinth was the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire, and they had a saying, everything is permissible for me. Everything is permissible for me. So Paul comes in and says, okay, I'm going to play off of that. Everything, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but I will not be mastered by anything. So the two questions are, is it beneficial? Does it have a mastery over me? On the beneficial side, when it comes to accountability, is the beneficial, it's not, and is beneficial, yes, it is. On the yes, it is, say I would, or would say to me, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking my wife out on date nights enough, or I'm not, I'm not taking my children out on one-on-ones. My daughter's out on date nights. And so he would ask me to hold him accountable. I write it down. I'm going to ask you next week. And, and matter of fact, on one recently that was really important, I said, don't come back until you've done that. Until you at least have set up a day. Don't come back. So if it's positive things that we want, we need encouragement and we need to be held accountable because life gets in the way and business gets in the way, then our, that person we're doing life with, our accountability partner, will hold us accountable. And in an encouraging way, as well as a challenging way. I don't know how you want to do life without someone in your life like that. And if it's a not beneficial thing, I'm looking at this too. I'm looking at this magazine or I've, there's this girl in my office or I've, you know, whatever it is, I'm eating too much. I'm eating too much ice cream at night. You know, I've gained five pounds. Sloppy or sinful. I want to be held accountable. I want someone to say, okay, have you done what, what's going on there? I wrote it down last week. What's happening with you on that? Let's, let's nip that in the bud. Do you need some help? That's the first line of defense when it comes to guardrails. But oftentimes what I've seen in these kind of sessions and with the various men over the years that, with whom I've dealt, they'll, they'll, they'll come back and say, you know, I did it again. I did it again. You know, my girlfriend and I went too far or I looked at porn again or I drank too much or I was, you know, it can be anything. I was dipping. I was smoking. I was eating too much. I, what, I didn't exercise. Whatever it is, they continue. And it's, it's something that happens over and over. And the typical response from your accountability partner is, well, I love you. And we, we serve a God of grace. And I'll keep praying for you. Well, after a while, that's just, that becomes ridiculous. If, after a while, it's time to step it up. And that's where guardrails come into play. And this is the real emphasis of what I want to send home with you. Guardrails. This is a technique that has been so effective in my life that it has radically changed various areas in my life. And I'm going to share a couple of them with you. And, and, uh, and, and this may seem ridiculous for you. Some of the a couple of things that I'll share with you, they may seem ridiculous. But I'll start off by saying years ago, I had a man come to see me and he said he had a porn addiction. And he, I thought he was more godly than I, and he probably was, but he had a point of it. So I asked him through the conversation, I said, what is it you want me to, why'd you come to see me about this? He said, well, I was hoping you could lay hands on me and pray and, and it would go away. And I said, I don't think I'm your guy for that, but here's what I will do. Write me a check for $5,000. 
And if you go on that porn site again, I get to keep the $5,000. And I'm not going to put it in 721 Ministries. I get to keep the $5,000. He wrote me a check. He never went on that website again. I had uh, a friend of mine who was dating a girl. They were both born again believers and they were going to get married. And he said, we are not going to have sex before we get married. I said, that's great. What's your plan? We're just not going to do it. I said, I got a better plan. Write me a check for $5,000. And if y'all have sex, I get to keep the $5,000. And go home and tell your fiance, because it's going to be her money too, that this is the agreement you've made. And he looked at me. He said, I need to pray about that. So he comes back a week later and I said, have you prayed about it? He said, yeah. I said, well, what have you, what, what have you decided? He said, can I make the check out for $500? You see, 500 is not going to get it done. You have to put into play something so draconian that it will stop it right there at the gate. Because that's where the barbarians are, that you have to stop it. In the very first two or three years of 721, so we're going back 15 years ago, I was looking for an exercise equipment site and somehow I ended up on a porn site. And I looked at it for a minute. Now, people that watch porn would say a minute's nothing, but I looked at it for a full minute. Now, you imagine if we ticked off 60 seconds, I looked at it for that 60 seconds. I clicked it off. I went about my day, probably did a 721 meeting, came back, clicked it back on and watched for another 60 seconds. And then I clicked that thing off and I said, that is poison. That is a drug that's going to get into my head and it's going to, it's going to dominate me like it has so many men and women. I got to do something about this because I live alone and there'll be nothing to stop me from doing this. So I called the two men, both board members at the time, who were giving $1,000 a month each to 721. And I needed it. We needed it back then badly. I couldn't survive without that. And I called both of them and I said, here's what I've done. And I'm going to make a vow before our Heavenly Father, a promise that I'll never go on that. I'll never do that again. And if I do, I want you to promise me that you will yank your funding for 721 ministries. And both of them said, oh, no, 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 no. I'll hold you accountable. I'll pray for you and I'll hold you accountable. I said, no, 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 I cannot do that. No, that won't work. That won't stop me in the moment. I need something that'll stop me in my tracks. Promise me that you'll yank your funding. Never went on the site again. Guardrails create so much freedom for us. See, I'm free now from that temptation. All right, that was never a big thing for me. I've had my others. But that shut it down. Now, I'm going to give you a little more on the sloppy side. Those were sinful things. I'm going to give you something on the sloppy side. True confession, I like to drink wine on Thursday nights and Friday nights and Saturday nights. I'll have a couple of glasses of wine. I rarely, if ever, get tipsy, but I do like wine. And when I get back to Greenville on Sunday night, I want one more glass of wine. Just one more on Sunday night. And what happens is I have that one glass and then I might have another glass or half of a glass and then I'm in the refrigerator and then I'm in the pantry. And over this COVID year that all of us dealt with, I gained five pounds. And I was talking to my friend, Patrick Maloney, who is a kind of an accountability partner with me. And, and he was, we, you know, we're talking about working out and I was, I got a great trainer I'm working with right now. And I said, you know, I'm feeling really good about that, but I can't get these five pounds off. And what I would have liked for him to say was, well, you don't have five pounds on you. You look great. But he said, yeah, I see the five pounds. What, what, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> he might as well have stuck a spear in my heart. So I started thinking, what can I do to get these five pounds off? Because I'm working out a lot. I eat really well. Sunday night. Sunday night. I have an addictive personality. I like that first glass of wine. I'm in the refrigerator. I'm in the pantry. So the next Sunday, I said, I'm not going to do it. I get home. Not going to have it. Gosh, I really would like to have a glass. You know what? I'll have a glass tonight. And I'll start it next Sunday. Same thing next Sunday. So I sat down with a friend of mine and I said, I'm going to write you a check for $1,000. And if I have a glass of wine, even a sip of wine on Sunday night, you get to keep the $1,000. 
Now on Sunday night, I can promise you I'm not drinking a thousand dollar glass of wine. It has nipped it in the bud. You see, take every thought captive. Think about the freedom this has given me. Here's the thought, the old thought, the previous thought. I like a glass of wine. No, I'm trying to lose weight. Oh, what the heck, I will. Now I'd like, and boom, I stop right then. Because I'm not drinking a thousand dollar glass of wine. I stop it right then. There's no more. I mean, that, that thought has been taken captive. If you have your children out playing in a playground, or let's say you're the parent there and you're responsible for recess that, that day, and there's no fence around the playground, how, how relaxed are you? How much freedom do you feel sitting there watching these children? You have to be an eagle eye. You have to be on point the whole time. But if you put a fence around it, now you can relax. I mean, they may fall off or something, but they're not going to run out in the street because you put a guardrail around it. There is so much freedom. So what I'm bringing home to you is this. If you have something in your life that's sloppy, you're watching too much TV, you're on your cell phone too much, you're looking at something that you shouldn't, you're eating too much, you've got that ice cream at night that you know is not working, or that extra glass of wine, or you're drinking wine every day at five o'clock and you can't wait to get to five o'clock to have that glass of wine, and every now and then it creeps up to four o'clock, or it's one glass, but then it becomes two or three. Dipping, playing too much golf, whatever it is, thoughts that come into your head, beefing the horn at people on the road. I'm just running through a whole list. You know what is sloppy in your life, what is sinful in your life, dirt in the carburetor, how are you going to stop it? Arnold Glass, Glassow said, temptation usually enters through a door that has been intentionally left open. Temptation enters through a door that has been intentionally left open. My friend Det Bauer says, partial obedience is planned disobedience. Partial obedience is planned disobedience. And my friend Covey Culverson says, I'll try is the weakest form of commitment. I'm giving you a tool that has worked in my life in both sloppy areas and sinful areas. You, you take it to heart or don't take it to heart. But if you have something in your life you want to change, I have not found a more effective way. When I, when I continue to fail over and over, I've not found a more effective way than setting up a guardrail that is so draconian that it shuts it down, that there's no chance it's going to happen. My friends, purifying our hearts so that we may see more of God is an incredible promise from him. And he's our heavenly father and Jesus is our savior. And, and I want to please them with my purified heart. May you take this to heart and really start to work on capturing all those thoughts and making them obedient to Christ. Setting up someone in your life who can be an accountability partner to encourage and challenge. And then when you need a guardrail, set that guardrail in place because your heart is the wellspring of life. Grace and peace be with you, my friends.